All right, All right let's get this party started. Good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to this virtual conversation about the incredible book uh, by Andrea Dennis and Eric Nielsen, uh, titled Rap on Trial, Race, Lyrics, and Guilt in America, uh, which is published last fall by the New Press. And thanks to New Press for all the promotion. Uh, my name is Wes Jackson. I'm the founder of the Brooklyn Hip Hop Festival uh, and director of the Business of Creative Enterprise Program at Emerson College in Boston. Um, this, need, this evening, I have the honor of moderating this discussion uh, with Eric and um, Andrea. Uh, Eric is the Associate Professor of Liberal Arts at the University of Richmond, and Andrea Dennis uh, holds the John Byrd Martin Chair of Law at the University of Georgia School of Law. Uh, this program is one in an ongoing series offered by the Brooklyn Historical Society about race, equity, and our nation's long history of discrimination. Uh, tonight's event is, is presented in partnership with New Press, and I want to thank everybody, Marsha and Bo and Deborah, everybody at the Brooklyn Historical Society for providing this uh, platform. Uh, before digging in, I want to invite those listening to share your questions. You can type them in the chat, uh, and then uh, Bo on the back end will feed them to me and I'll, and I'll feed them to our, our esteemed scholars. Um, we're gonna be going back and forth between the conversation with your questions and you know our uh, conversation. And I also lastly want to mention that the book is available at a discount on uh, website bookshop.org. Buy that book, right? We gotta get those royalties popping so we can keep the, the good work done. Uh, we'll put a link to bookshop.org in the chat uh, for your convenience so you can purchase while we're talking. So uh, without further ado, it is my pleasure to introduce uh, Andrea Dennis and Eric Nielsen, who, I, who are all up now. Um, so I gave you this sort of very, very brief interview, but maybe we let's just start with you guys explaining, you know, your field of study, how you guys got to, you know, individually, and then how you guys got to together and collectively worked on this uh, amazing book. Andrea, let's go chronological. You go first. Oh, oh, you're trying to call me old, the old head. OK, <laughs> so um, uh, I joined academia in 2006. Uh, my first position was at the University of Kentucky College of Law, where I taught criminal law, criminal procedure, uh, family law, and a seminar on criminal, criminal law and procedure. Um, about four years after that, I moved to the University of Georgia, and I've been here at the University of Georgia since 2010. I continue to teach criminal law. I also teach a course called Evidence, which is um, the heart of this book, uh, and um, family law and juvenile law as well. Uh, before entering academia, I practiced for quite a number of years in a variety of different uh, capacities, but the one most relevant to this particular topic is that I had been an assistant federal public defender in Maryland. So I was representing indigent folks who had been accused of federal crimes, um, uh, representing them in federal court as they faced uh, prosecution. And so I think I bring a number of different uh, roles and backgrounds to this particular um, topic as well. I try and use it also in my teaching and my scholarship in general. And so my scholarship focuses, at least certainly right now, a lot on criminal defense lawyering, um, uh, racial bias, unconscious bias, and criminal justice. Um, and then also I have another bucket of research I do, family and juvenile justice. But all of it is really trying to look through the veneer of criminal justice and its impact on society. Uh, uh, outstanding. And then real quick before I jump to Eric, I misspoke. Uh, so everybody watching, please put your questions into the Q&A. Uh, which you'll see at the bottom of your screen, not the chat, into the Q&A, and then uh, we'll get it from there. Uh, so Eric, you want to go ahead? Sure. Um, my, my background is uh, in literature. I'm an English professor. Um, that's what my PhD is in. Uh, I, I have long studied you know, African-American literature, but anyone who studies African-American literature understands that to study the literature is also to study the music because of the close connection between the two. And a lot of my work has been centered on the relationship between black art and the United States and policing and policing sort of writ large, right? This can be the actual police, it can be prosecution, it can be regulation. And that's really what I focused on, beginning with the antebellum South all the way up to hip hop. 
And as I started to push that research further, I started to realize that these rap lyrics were being criminalized in uh, courtrooms across the United States. And I, th I was not only surprised that it, that was happening, but also that nobody was talking about it. And it turns out that Andrea was talking about it years before I was doing that work. Um, and so we sort of teamed up and worked back and forth for a while, but essentially this is an extension of my work as well, which is really looking at the way law enforcement, uh, again, writ large, relates to uh, black literary and uh, musical traditions, but in hip hop, it's such a, sadly, it's such a rich area for research that I don't do much outside of that these days. So, um, and so you guys got together because you sort of discovered each other doing similar work. You kind of have a nice anecdote in the book about um, how it all po sort of popped up. So just, I guess maybe just to rewind to provide a little structure. So the, the, the point of the book is what? Like, just give me like the, the, the short and sweet. What are you trying to, what did you try to, what are you trying to accomplish with the book? And I think it's also interesting that the times that we're having this conversation, it's, I love it because it gives you some really things that we can do. But what is, but let me not, let me be quiet. You guys explain, what is it sort of in summation? So, so maybe um, when I first wrote um, uh, the article that Eric mentioned, it was, it was 2007. And um, really at the time I was, new, I was new to academia and I was just looking around for topics of interest um, uh, that I could explore um, I'm also uh, what, what I think of as an interdisciplinarian, so I, I really do enjoy looking at the combination of more than one discipline, so law and, um, here law and society, or law and literature, or law and popular culture, pick your, pick your bucket. Um, and so this um, uh, fell into my lap, uh, and I thought, this, this can't be right, I never heard of this in practice. Um, uh, for the most part, we had maybe one case in my office and I thought that was a one-off, never really heard anything about it again. Um, but then I started looking around and finding that, whoa, there are actually quite a number of these cases in which rap lyrics are being used as criminal evidence. And I kept digging and digging uh, and just became more and more confused and more and more concerned about what the hell was happening here. Um, and so, you know, I wrote that first article really just to um, explore what I thought was an odd phenomenon, what I thought was um, uh, certainly an unethical um, uh, and uh, practice on the part of prosecutors, what I thought was uh, a, um, a very dangerous tactic. Um, and also, if I could be a little personal here, right, it was um, going to the heart of a music genre that I grew up with, that I love. I mean, I was there, um, I was a little young, but I was there, you know, at the birth of hip hop. And so, you know, you're now seeing, right, um, a, a genre and artistry that I love being used in this way to persecute uh, Black men. And so the, the article was really to draw attention to the issue, to explore um, how we can begin to give leverage and options to defendants who were really having difficulty challenging this tactic. Um, so I'll stop there and let's let's hear a little bit maybe about what yeah. Eric's first thoughts. Were. Oh, I'll be I'll be uh, I'll be I'll be brief. I mean the 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 point of the book is to expose the the fact that, you know the extent to which the criminal justice system is finding all kinds of I think we would both all agree illegitimate means to lock up uh, young black men, young Hispanic men, uh, and they are using rap music in order to do it, but they are targeting uh, the music and the people who create it. And they are targeting it in ways that they will not target any other sort of fictional genre. This could be musical, this could be film, this could be literature. It's strictly, uh, it's almost exclusive to rap music. And what we see is that there are trial after trial, and I work on these trials all the time, is that people are being put away for their artistic expression in ways that we would never accept if it were from, say, oh, uh, somebody who's white. Um, this is absolutely, uh, it, it's almost efficient in the way that it targets 
um, young African American and in some parts of the country, you know, Latin, Latino men. Uh, that's, that's what the, the thesis is. They are targeting an art form in a way that they would never target others. And it is leading to devastating consequences ranging from a few years in prison to the death penalty. Yeah, it's sort of chilling when you use the, the, the word efficient, right? Um, so when you say that, uh, especially these days and times. But um, let's, so back to the, sort of the, uh, the book. I, as I uh, read the book, one of the best parts about it as a hip hop nerd, you know, as Andrew, somebody who grew up in the culture, you know, same um, sort of simultaneously, how you framed the formation of hip hop culture as the premise, you know, for explaining your cases and the ultimate thesis. So if you could just maybe walk us through, you know, that part of the book where you basically explain Zulu Nation and things and graph culture and how an understanding of that may you know, uh, sort of work against this efficient yet brutal tactic. Andrea, can I start? Yep, you start. Yeah, so I would say that, you know, one of the things that you, it, the ways that you experience hip hop culture and rap music as an everyday American, somebody who's not necessarily dialed into it, is that it perpetuates violence, it perpetuates all kinds of illicit behavior. It is responsible for all kinds of, you know, antisocial behavior. But that is absolutely contrary to the history of it. So whether I'm, we're going to write a book about it or whether I'm going to talk to a jury about it, it's about first setting uh, the sort of basic rules of this discussion. And, the, and it goes like this. I mean, you go to the early 1970s. Um, the Bronx, right? Everybody regards this as the as the, the the birth of hip hop. It is a story of urban decay. You have Pope John Paul II, Mother Teresa, Jimmy Carter, then president, then candidate Ronald Reagan visiting just to sort of witness the devastation firsthand. And what you see, what you saw in that area was that it was overrun by gang violence. But there were a number of people in the Zulu nations, a perfect example. We talk about Africa Bombada as one of the people in, you know, as in the movement, but there are many others um, who explicitly saw hip hop as a way to take the territoriality of gang life, the aggression of gang life, but, at, but, but absolutely transform it into something that was um, artistic, that was productive, that was obviously nonviolent. And that, and as you saw hip hop progress, you saw the grip that gangs had on the Bronx and other parts of New York, you saw it weaken. And I'm not gonna try to overstate this, but there's no question that hip hop played a, a, a central role in, in, in making those areas safer where police and politicians could not. So if you start with that, which we try to do, that's the way of framing the evolution of hip hop and, you know, and rap music specifically, is that it has actually provided opportunities. It has actually made communities safer and, it's, and, and there's a certain beauty to it as a result of that. So I think one of the um, other points we wanna emphasize in terms of the history is that um, while we're talking about um, uh, urban decay and policing um, in uh, urban centers and its contribution to the rise of hip hop um, is to keep in mind that there has always been a dynamic relationship between um, policing and criminal justice and black American music um, in America, beginning from Antebellum era and slave songs, right? That were both prag pragmatic in nature, right? They, they made working more bearable, I'll, I'll say that, um, uh, but also a way to avoid surveillance, right? The prying eyes of slave masters, right? And a way to resist. So they were subversive in that sense, right? But the black musical tradition has long been responding to policing um, and uh, criminal justice measures from antebellum era through uh, modern day rap music, right? And in particular, that large bucket of gangster rap, if, if we wanna call it a very large bucket, which is an over-inclusive term, um, but which derives from, right, again, urban decay, which a significant aspect of that is policing and um, uh, hyper-policing um, in uh, urban communities, um, which gives a fair amount of content to uh, rap music. So this is not just 
something that is limited to rap music. This is a part of um, Black American musical history. Yeah, I, again, to everybody listening, I can't encourage you in this day and time to read this book because not only uh, over-policing, right, we're talking about, but now with this stuff about the Confederate monuments, you see this sort of antebellum, this idea of Africans sort of performance and the sort of uh, secretive nature, I forget the quote you guys have from Jay, uh, that hip hop is deceptive, right? And how it ties all the way back is, it's, it's quite brilliant. It makes you look at everything that I see on the news with a, with a slightly different um, sort of focus. Um, so uh, we do have one question that uh, popped in and uh, well, let's, we can get to it. Um, and before I come back to mine, I uh, want to make sure we get these through. Um, so the first question is, does it hurt those charged with crimes when Blacks themselves oppose rap out of fealty to respectability mm -hmm. politics? And we mentioned respectability when we were on the call yesterday. So that's a good one. Uh, what's your take, guys? Oh, Andrea, you, you brought oh. this up yesterday, so take it and run with it. I, yeah. It's hard for me to get into, involved in black respectability politics, <laughs> right? I'm gonna let you have this one. Yeah, I, you know, I don't know if I can do it justice to, to, to the conversation we were having um, yesterday, but I think um, in some sense, right, um, what we see and hear sometimes uh, in terms of criticism of our work is, well, um, how can you support these artists, right? They're just producing trash, right? It's hyper-violent, right? It glamorizes violence, right? It's misogynistic. Um, it's, it is essentially not respectable uh, art form or music, and it actually undermines uh, efforts in the Black community. So. Um, we certainly hear this criticism a lot. I think there are probably two responses. One is that's a fairly elementary way, I think, to view rap music uh, as an entire genre, and in particular, again, that large bucket of gangster rap, which is part of the conversation we have in the book, right? You um, should not take your very simplistic, literal viewpoint of uh, this music in, in trying to understand what any particular artist or defendant uh, has created. Um, and the other is, uh, right, and this, this very moment in time um, reveals to us, it doesn't matter how respectable you may be. Um, for Black folk, Black men, Black women who are facing criminal justice uh, actors, police, prosecutors, respectability does not necessarily prevent you from uh, becoming a target um, uh, of the criminal justice system. And so, um, you know, to some extent, I, I, I think that criticism that we get uh, is, is, is a knee-jerk criticism um, uh, when folks just uh, are concerned that we're, we're supporting um, uh, music that is unworthy of artistic recognition, that is unworthy of um, any sort of uh, understandings as complex uh, and thoughtful uh, and subversive and political um, in any way. Wes, can I just add like just uh, one comment, which is that it's interesting that you mentioned that because I work on lots, I've probably worked on 60, 70 of these cases. I've testified in maybe 10 or so. Um, and, and attorneys often will reach out to me as they're selecting their juries. And they'll say, hey, look, you're gonna be excited about this because there are a lot of jurors of color. There are black jurors on there. And my first response is always, that is not necessarily going to work for you. Like, if anything, age works for you. It, younger is better when it comes to understanding rap music, but also these various artistic traditions, because, because of what you're talking about, respectability, politics, religion, right? Like the church has always had issues with black music. And so it has, it, it's really about acknowledging that, um, it, because a juror is black does not mean you're going to get a, a not guilty. You, it doesn't mean you're going to get somebody who's going to see it the way you want to. Um, yes, that's an important element of it because if you're black in America, you at some level descend from these traditions, but it, that is not it at all. And you have to be careful because of that. Yeah, I think um, sort of a good, one th there's a question popped in, but I'm going to get to that was in, in this sort of a quick segue. But I was so you look at like uh, 
sort of Trump's language and he like likes to call like, people like thugs, right? That's like a nice little cold word, but I think it's, it's Tupac's birthday today and people don't, it's that, the popularization of that term is so connected to the culture that it is an obvious backdoor. But um, if you can, in talking about um, respectability, there's a great section in the book where you talk about uh, country music doesn't have to deal with this, metal doesn't have to do with this. Um, and my personal favorite about comparing like the complexities of a haiku to rock him, but maybe just talk a little bit about, um, you know, that about, about why is it, how, how you can see the hypocrisy of it all when Johnny Cash was never brought to trial after, you know, Folsom State songs. Um, but just, we talk a little bit about that, then I'm gonna pivot to, to bring in some examples of your cases. Andrea, should I start? Yeah, I think you're right. Uh, I mean, obviously you're right. So one of the things that we point out over and over in our argument that rap music is targeted, whereas other genres are not, centers on country, heavy metal, right? If you're familiar with country music, you know that it has the sort of this long tradition um, of embracing the murder ballad, right? We can talk about Johnny Cash, uh, you know, killing the man in Reno to watch him die, you know, one more round, Dilly is gone. But country music has always had that as part of its legacy, part of its tradition, but we're not seeing any of these cases. And so rather than go through all the literature on this, I'll just say that there is empirical research that shows that people are discriminating against rap music. So here, there was a study once by a social psychologist named Carrie Freed. And what she did was she took some stock lyrics from the Kingston Trio, it was like a folk group, it just had some stock violent lyrics. And she took away all of the information that would reveal what genre it was, who wrote it, who sang it, any of it. And she had some, some participants in her study and she divided them into two groups and she gave the lyrics to one group and said, this is a country song. Gave the exact same lyrics to another group and said, this is a rap song and then measured their responses. And what she found, and by the way, this has been replicated like in 2016 to 2017, what she found was that people who perceived this to be a rap song found it to be considerably more threatening and in need of re regulation than those who believe that the exact same lyrics were a country song. So this is a way that we're kind of triangulating on our point, which is that this is race is front and center. Right. This is we say this early on. This is not a First Amendment issue with racial implications. This is a racial issue with First Amendment implications. And we see it in every way. But we have scholarship that backs it up. Uh, and I think to be clear here, um, we have looked for and continue to look for cases involving other musical genres and in fact, even other artistic genres. Um, uh, and uh, we it's nearly impossible to find cases involving, um, if, for example, country music. Uh, we may find more cases involving uh, various forms of metal, heavy metal, death metal. Um, but those cases are interesting because uh, there, the, the fear that the uh, prosecutors are playing on is that um, someone who listens to heavy metal or death metal is a danger to themselves. Right. Um, and occasionally they may act, um, they may be motivated by the music. Right. But what you don't see, for example, is that their um, artistic uh, appreciation or any music that they have written is being used against them in the same way that it is being used here. Uh, and so it is certainly the case that we are looking for those um, and we are not finding those particular cases. Um, and so it's just quite apparent. Um, whether we're looking at uh, country music or metal uh, of any of the varieties or even punk, um, uh, that those cases just don't exist. Or yeah, they are so hard to find. There are so few and far between. And the, and the research really does show us that people's perceptions of these musical genres is very different. So whereas people perceive uh, heavy metal uh, as something, for example, probably punk too, but certainly heavy metal 
as a music that causes the people who produce it to be dangerous to themselves. With rap music, it's that the perception is that the people producing it are dangerous to you, are dangerous to somebody else. And, that's the, that, and that helps explain the sort of the government, the public response. The criminalizing being black, right? Uh, prime example. So the um, question is, somebody asked if there was a case currently that we should be aware of. So I want to sort of hold on to that thought, but also maybe if you want to uh, also pull out some cases that you reference in the book to give us some context of really what, like now that we get the set up, like let's get down to work. What is what are some of these examples? And then maybe if you can, if there's if there's something you know, so circling in the air right now that we can uh, get our antennas in tune to. So maybe I'll start with what we think um, or we have identified is maybe the seed case. Uh, the first case that we are able to identify as. Um, a published opinion that's talking about the use of rap lyrics as criminal evidence is, comes from uh, 1991, and it's uh, United States versus Foster, um, which we talk about uh, in some depth in the book. It's a drug distribution case, and so Foster, Derek Foster, was um, arrested in Chicago um, while he was getting off of the train um, in, I think it's Union Station there in Chicago as well. Uh, and so he had been traveling from LA to the East Coast, somewhere apparently in Maryland, uh, and agents had been watching him. Uh, and as he got off the train in Chicago, for some reason, um, officers um, approached him. They had uh, suspected there was a problem with some suitcases he was carrying because they would fall over and they would emit puffs of smoke. Um, and so they, uh, asked him about uh, the suitcases, whether they were his, and he denied ownership. Puffs of, of white powder, by the way. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Uh, and so um, he was carrying also a bag at the time, a, a backpack, and the officers asked whether that was his backpack. He acknowledged that it was, was his, uh, and he um, allowed them to search the backpack. And um, in the backpack, they found what they believe were various items, which were indicia of drug distribution, some notes, maybe some records, uh, not albums, but record keeping. Um, and then uh, also some lyrics. And the lyrics um, used what uh, we consider to be very generic rap uh, lingo, talking about um, keys of drugs and pounds of drugs. And uh, I'm a drug dealer, you know, I sell all over town. Um, so, but fairly generic. And so in any event, he's uh, charged with drug distribution. Um, ultimately, these lyrics that he acknowledged were his and that he had written were brought in as evidence to suggest knowledge and familiarity with drug distribution uh, and drugs in particular. Ultimately, he's convicted um, uh, and sentenced. And so that's the, the first case that we have been able to identify. Uh, there certainly may be cases before that, um, but it's... Uh, hard to find cases and we can talk about that for a host of other reasons. Um, but so drug cases are a common uh, type of case in which these are evol uh, involved and also the lyrics are then used to show knowledge about particular criminal behavior. So whether here it's drug distribution, it could be knowledge of firearms for a firearm case, it could be knowledge of gang activities for a gang case. Um, uh, but also mindset, um, one's intent to engage in criminal behavior, one's knowledge and ability and desire to engage in criminal behavior. Um, Eric, you wanna you wanna hop in, or you want me to keep going here? Yeah, I'm muted. Sorry, I'm happy to. Um, yeah, I was gonna say. I mean, there are so many, and and we've we've identified you know more than 500 cases. But we, you know, that involve the use of rap lyrics in some sort of criminal prosecution. But we know that it's significant. That's a tip of the iceberg. We know it's in thousands. I mean, there's no question. It's probably bigger than that. But that's where we are. And there are some really egregious examples. So um, I, I'll give you just a really quickly a couple. Um, one is uh, a arguably the best lyricist on No Limit Records, uh, a guy named McKinley Phipps, who went by Mac, or Mac the Camouflage Assassin. Uh, he was basically set up for a, a shooting that he clearly did not commit. I mean, to the point where multiple witnesses have since recanted, saying that 
Louisiana authorities threatened them. They had threatened one woman who was pregnant and said, if you don't say he did it, uh, you're going to have your baby in prison. But a bunch of those, somebody else walked forward and confessed who actually matched the descriptions. That wasn't the point. What you saw in places like uh, uh, New Orleans, but we see it elsewhere, is that the criminal justice system is setting people up. And so he went to trial. This is a this is the son of artists. This is a guy who has no criminal background at all. Uh, he's just good at this. And he realizes he can make money from his poet, poetic abilities. And he takes on a persona. He's still sitting in prison. 30-year sentence. He wasn't even convicted unanimously. He was convicted 10 to 2, which today would not stand, right? Because New Orleans or Louisiana just recently changed this. But, and we're working to work on the retroactive part. But this is a guy who everybody knows did not do it. But what the prosecutor did was introduce his rap persona. This is Mac the Camouflage Assassin. He took, the prosecutor took lyrics from two different songs, altered the words from both, and then spliced them together as if they appeared in the same song. And Mac goes away for 30 years. We have another one much more recently in New Jersey, a guy named Bonte Skinner. There's a shooting. There's no real evidence tying this guy to the crime. Even the eyewitnesses are like, yeah, he did it. And then a second later are saying, no, he definitely didn't do it. And so in order to get a conviction, prosecutors in New Jersey were allowed to read 12 or 13 pages of his, you know, sort of gangster rap lyrics uninterrupted in front of the jury, even though they were written months or years before the actual crime and made no mention of any detail specific to the crime. That's the kind of thing we're up against. And we could go on and on and on. So maybe let me just say the other bucket of cases we see besides these sort of drug, violent crime, uh, gang cases, the other large bucket we see um, that has emerged in the last uh, five to 10 years or so are the threats cases. And so these are cases in which the lyrics are actually considered to be the instrument of the crime themselves. In other words, someone um, writes a, set of lyrics or a song, um, which is then interpreted to be a threat to a particular individual or a particular setting. And so the individual is charged with terroristic threats or making a threat um, uh, that could harm another individual. Uh, and so um, maybe one of the, the most recent cases involving this um, uh, is Jamal Knox out of uh, Pennsylvania. Um, he and a buddy of his had grown up um, you know, writing rap, right? And this was something they found as a therapeutic outlet, something they did as, as an artistic outlet, something they were doing to make money. Um, everyone knew this about them, but they had also in their, their neighborhood um, dealt a lot with police misconduct and police brutality, both to themselves and to their friends and community members. Uh, and so uh, in particular, one of their friends or acquaintances had been uh, shot by law enforcement and severely injured. And so um, they wrote a song, an homage, essentially, to NWA's Fuck the Police. Um, theirs was titled, it was also Fuck the Police. Uh, and so um, in that song, they identified a number of cops who had been accused of police, police violence. Uh, and that was then found online um, uh, by some other officers, and they were charged with making terroristic threats. Uh, and so... Um, if you hear Knox write about how they created the song, it was um, political, right? It was a song that was talking about the violence that was happening in their community, the hyper-policing, right? The aggressive policing, uh, mass incarceration. Um, they had grown up experiencing this from a very young age. And so this song was about what they had been experiencing. And even though they were able to identify the cops because they knew who the cops were uh, in the song, um, right, their, their goal was not to make an actual threat of violence against these officers. Nevertheless, they're convicted. The court rejects any notion that there's First Amendment protections. Um, uh, the court uh, assumes that this was evidence of their particular mindset to threaten these officers. The, um, the court actually said uh, in Pennsylvania that it had no social or political commentary because that is supposed to give you sort of heightened protection under the First Amendment because you're supposed to be able to criticize your government. How can you not think that fuck the police is a criticism, <laughs> a social or political criticism, but that was the position that they took? 
So it's not a criticism, but it's a it's a threat, right? It's a, you're going to you're, you're a terrorist. You're literally you're a, terrorist. a terrorist. And so the problem with the First Amendment that we identify is it's not the First Amendment, but the First Amendment, the way the jurisprudence and the way people have responded to it is that the First Amendment has actually been wielded as a weapon against rappers, right? So first you use uh, obscenity because in, you know, the First Amendment is very brief on speech. It's like you can't abridge speech, but the courts have over time created all these categories of speech you can't abridge. So first they go after obscenity and Luther Campbell and Two Live Crew knock that down. Now we're going to get uh, we're going to turn it into terroristic threats. And that is actually sticking far more with defendants of color than with white people, at least based on our still anecdotal research. But we know that the First Amendment has other categories that, the, that, that, that prosecutors are going to use against rappers. It's going to be certainly defamation, which is more simple, but it's going to be incitement right? Incitement to violence. We're very worried that the First Amendment, at least the people you, who pretend to be First Amendment advocates and attorneys, have let this slide so far that uh, the, rapper, uh, the rappers that we're talking about here are not going to survive uh, continued uh, assaults from prosecutors. So let me just say, so certainly there are some of these threats cases where the allegation is that um, an individual is threatening another local community member or a local gang member. Um, but there are these, these numbers of cases in which we've seen where there are um, political overtones, apparent political overtones to a song where it is uh, in the genre of conscious rap. Um, and, and yet it's still being prosecuted as a threat. Just um, quickly, there another um, case is Taylor Bell, a high school student who wrote a song about um, teachers allegedly sexually harassing and abusing uh, girls, uh, students in the school. Um, and he called out those teachers in the song. Um, and while this did not result in criminal prosecution, he was essentially um, suspended for the remainder of the semester, which was his senior year, um, and sent to an alternative school. But he was quite clearly writing um, a um, political song about alleged sexual abuse um, or misconduct occurring in his high school. And for that, uh, it was considered to be a threat to those teachers, even though nothing had happened in the schoolhouse. Never students, performed it. Right. He hadn't performed it. Um, students weren't in an uproar and there was no disruption to the school uh, environment. So we do see um, even conscious rap or political rap um, being, uh, being caught up in this. Which kind of was, was the next question, was touching on it, it was, uh, has there been a decrease in socially conscious and political minded rap, i.e. public enemy, NWA, KRS, Tupac? And I think that's what they're saying. I, I, I don't want to sort of put the words in whoever wrote this mouth, but is this a function of these particular records that have coming out like trap records or gangster records or almost like a homage back when we were, you know, when it was Tribe Called Quest and Fight the Power and all this stuff, was this not happening, right? So do you, is, is, I guess, is there a temporal aspect in here that it really starts with songs recorded after this point, not backwards? It, it does work that way just because we're only finding stuff that, be, that, that, that starts in the early 1990s with the case that, that Andrea mentioned. But as a general rule, though, she is absolutely correct when we're talking about threats, conscious rap tends to, yeah, it does get caught up. And I want to say, and I'm going to get killed for this if I get it wrong, but I think it was Talib Kweli who relayed an anecdote where he was talking to somebody at the airline and they overheard some lyrics for a song he was listening to that was political. And he was, and, and there was some sort of issue as a result of that. Uh, I hope I got those details right. I think I did. But as a general rule, no. As a general rule, you're not, I mean, I don't, I mean, I'm sure Chuck D is being surveilled. I'm sure Chuck D is in the crosshairs of the FBI because if you are any kind of progressive, never mind radical, uh, black spokesman, especially as a man, you, but no, women too, you are, you, you are, you just assume you're being watched. And those folks already know it. But what we see in these cases is that it's really the, the rappers that work off these gangsta or, you know, whether it's trap music regionally or drill or whatever you want to call it, but it's still this idea of glorifying illicit behavior. 
That is the stuff that, that is definitely by far what we see in these trials, more than the conscious rap. But be clear, if you are a conscious rapper and you are taking on the establishment, you can ask all kinds of people, we have parrot, you know, anybody, right. you, you, you will face consequences too, but it's in the, getting caught up in this net is usually around the, the gangster rap sort of subgenre and all the subgenres that it's spawned. Right. I so can I, oh, so, go ahead, Andrew. Sorry. Yeah, can I say here, Wes, so one of the themes we explore in the book is uh, the commercialization of rap, right? Uh, and so, uh, right, in the, in the late 80s, 90s, you have the, the beginnings of um, uh, gangster rap, um, which um, is very successful from a commercial perspective. Um, and which, um, you know, over the years, uh, large production companies, music production companies, the music industry, right, has uh, embraced, uh, again, I'm going to give it that large bucket of gangster rap um, uh, as the, the sort of dominant uh, paradigm. If you produce this kind of music, right, then that will make you a successful artist. If you produce music with certain themes, violence, um, uh, drugs, uh, women, um, misogyny, it will, those sorts of themes are what sells. Now we can have a whole conversation about why the music industry is willing to embrace that those are the themes or sell or that sell or why the, the intended audience um, uh, enjoys those particular types of, of lyrics. But um, what we see is, um, and in particular Eric sees this when he's consulting with individuals is that right there's an understanding that this is the type of music you should produce if you want to at, all become commercially successful. But yet this is also the same music that is then being used to prosecute. So you call it a trap, call it's it a, a catch 22, um, whatever have you. The point is we do believe that there is uh, the influence of commercialization that is contributing to this particular problem. So Never fear, this, amateur, artists, amateur artists understand what the market wants. Yes. And just to be clear, it's funny, it's funny you say that trap artists often will acknowledge this outright, right? The trap of the life that they're in, the trap, obviously the place where they're selling drugs or whatever else, but the idea that you have to do something to get out of it. Rap has been that path for the vast majority of people that I've worked with. So it's really an attempt. It really is an attempt to get out of that life. The life that you're chronicling in your lyrics, right? The, the violence, uh, the poverty, the drug addiction, you're using rap to get out of it. So the fact that we create this demand for those kinds of lyrics and then we punish them when you make them, that is the, that is the trap we're trying to expose. Yeah, it seems to be a feature, not a bug, if you ask me, uh, when you put those two data points together. But um, let's just, I want to, uh, while we have time, get to everybody's question. Uh, Next one was uh, sort of a good, interesting one. It's weird to me that lots of rap fans are suburban white kids, yet prosecutors can still find traction in the idea that rap influences crime. And asking to speak to this, I, 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 it's a strange thing that like white suburban kids don't commit crime. So how could you draw the connect? It's just, I don't know. I, I, uh, that was a little bit loaded, but yes, I we do. What I'm to say is <laughs> we do commit crime. We just don't get punished for it, right? I mean, we yeah. know, for example, that marijuana usage is basically the same among black and white people. We listen. I'm not going to go into my personal history because that's incriminating. However, however, that is a fair question, and we've grappled with this because how is it that rap music has become? the most listened to rap R&B, that sort of category, and I know somebody had a question about that too, but that rap has become the most listened to genre, arguably the most influential musical genre of the last 50 or 60 years. You would think that that would make prosecutions less likely as mainstream American society understood its conventions, but it's been the opposite. As it's grown more popular, it's also being punished more. And, and one of the theories that I'll say I have, but Andrea and I have talked this through, and I think we agree on it to some extent, is that there are lots of people, lots of white people especially, who feel surrounded by it. its popularity, the fact that it's influencing country. You have hip hop, 
right? You have all, all the things that you thought were gonna be, that were gonna exclude the people you wanted to exclude have been infiltrated by rap music. It is that influential. And I think for some people, it has triggered a response that has been even more aggressive. It's counterintuitive in some ways, but it does make sense in others. So are you saying, if I can, so are you almost saying that this is uh, what you guys have written about is a sort of a, a, a counterpunch to that? Is that because white kids in suburbia are consuming it, is this the attempt from regressive people to push, to by criminalizing it to, to silence it in a sense. Yeah, I, or at least, that. yeah, I mean, I think people care less about the music and more about the people producing it, right? And you're looking for every single way that you have to silence those young black men. I mean, there is no case in my mind that is more poignant than the case of Jordan Davis. And he's not, a, he wasn't, I don't think he was a rapper, but he was a kid in a car in Florida who was playing his music too loud for the taste of some old white guy. And although everyone in that car is, uh, in Jordan Davis's car is unarmed, he ends up shot. And it's over an altercation about thug music. And I think lots of white people feel like black people have, if I may, have overstepped their place. And, their, and so for these angry white people or these scared white people, I don't even know for sure, but it's definitely a response to Hip hop has given black people a voice and some people don't want that. That's the truth. So, and when we, um, again, we try to cover our bases and we look for cases involving uh, white folks, right? And they are few and far between. Um, but for the ones we do, in particular ones involving young white men who have either quoted lyrics or written their own lyrics, right? Um, many of those cases are dismissed um, or not prosecuted as fully as um, those that would have involved black men. Um, many of these are threats cases. Uh, and the, maybe it's sort of the notion um, is that, you know, they're just, they're just being a teenager, right? They aren't really that dangerous. They're just writing these, these lyrics or quoting these lyrics, right? So for white kids, it is just sort of something that you enjoy as a teen. It doesn't really suggest that you are a danger at all to the community. Boys will be boys. Boys will be boys, or at least white boys will be white boys, Correct. right? Um, because, because this is where the race comes in. Black boys, black men will be black men. And what is it that we understand about black men is that they are hyper-violent, right? They are a danger. They are criminals. And so those who are producing this music that um, uh, white America enjoys, right? Those are the ones who are the danger, whether actually or literally in the streets or whether to social norms and values. Um, I think can I say the, there's a- Yes, go, go ahead, please. Go ahead, Wes. No, 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 go, it's, it's your, your um, work. I know what she's gonna do. Go, prison pipeline. Uh -oh. I don't know. School to prison no, pipeline. No, I wasn't. Oh, okay. No, no, I, I, I'll leave that for no, now. Someone no, someone um, okay, so the, uh, there's a question also about how the police learn about uh, rap lyrics in the first place. <laughs> I was going to jump to that, uh, but yes, go ahead, Andrea. You're, this, you're go ahead. in my head. Yeah, so surveillance, surveillance, surveillance. Um, and so uh, we have a whole chapter that's devoted to the existence of um, online policing, essentially, where there are officers or units of law enforcement officers or even individual officers um, who will search online um, uh, these days, mostly online for Facebook postings, for uh, YouTube postings, for um, any online platform um, they will look to and they will search. Um, they have individuals they are searching for that they are following. They have groups of individuals that they have identified as um, a danger or a gang, and so they will follow them and they will look for all of the connections. Um, uh, so maybe we think the most common way these days is to just look online. So surveillance, surveillance, surveillance. Um, there is still some old school policing. So if someone is arrested and they search their um, bag, they may still find you know, handwritten lyrics um, in a bag or if they search their bedroom, they might still find handwritten lyrics on some paper um, in a bedroom. Um, those cases still do uh, uh, exist, or they will find out about someone's mixtape or CD. I guess CD might what? be 
outdated. What is mixtape. the CD? Yeah, I know, okay. I know. But you know, every once in a while, I don't know, what do mixtapes get put out on, I guess, right? Online, right? So the point is surveillance, surveillance for surveillance. And, and that's especially true for gang police. Uh, that's in New York, that's elsewhere, these police departments that are so overfunded and bloated, they, they're actually looking for crimes to create. And we know that gang police in particular, are they spend half their day in some cases just watching YouTube videos of rap music and, and looking for crime. I, I'm not exaggerating. These pe and, and, and studies have shown that they are not effective. They're not good at their jobs. They don't know what the communities need. They are not effectively identifying actual gang members, but they are getting lots of arrests. And because of rap lyrics, they're getting lots of convictions. You know, I, I know we're running short on time and I wanna um, pivot to action items, which I think is so great in the book. But I was always thinking, I guess this isn't in your purview, but I was thinking about how many rappers of like our generation have just been arrested from Ja Rule to Wayne to Ghostface, you know what I mean? Uh, it's, it's just like, there's so many people just get locked up. I, yeah, anyway, the, the Hip Hop Police is probably your next book. I Makes it hard to understand how the murders of Tupac and Biggie, who were almost certainly being watched, and Jam Master Jay, who were certainly being watched by somebody could go unsolved this long. That's all I'm gonna say about yeah, that. Yeah, exactly. Um, so the, I, wait, maybe we'll slide in this one last question, if you guys can be brief, and then I'll turn it over to you. You can give us some marching orders. Is there was a question about, um, what would love to hear your take on the Grammys renaming urban contemporary to progressive R&B. Um, is, is this helping sort of this discrimination or are these, well, industry terms, I, what I want to get out of it, because now there's a big thing of not using urban, right, anymore at the record label. I mean, is, is this, this kind of goes back to the beginning of the respectability. Like, is this going to make a change if we ch change the nomenclature or are we spitting in the wind? I think we solved it. I think if we just change the name of that one category, this whole thing goes away. Like I was oh, just, sorry, you guys yeah, no, like I just, I want to be clear that that should have been, and we did not include that in our, our conclusion, but if we could just rename an award, I think we're good. Right, right. All right, we'll Andrea. Call it country. If we call, if we call, yeah, it, we call country, it country, it's fine. Yeah, no. But isn't that a good point though, right? Is that, well, no, because it's not, it's, yeah, but you're funny because you have the same content under different labels, but it's really the people. It's not the labels, right? Correct. America hates black people. And, so, right. And that, so, and, one thing we'll say in the, um, and I, you know, I've referred to this a number of times, this large bucket of gangster rap in, in court proceedings, what you will hear is it's labeled gangster rap. There is no nuance. There's no precision, specificity. They, there's no attempt to understand the diversity of rap music, the diversity of um, uh, the regional diversity. So uh, even if there were a change from a commercial perspective. I'm not sure that that's going to trickle down because the expert, the government experts, so to speak, are not that nuanced at all in their testimony. No interest, so it's not going to happen. Well, they're um, not, not just not nuanced, they're ignorant. Willfully ignorant, right? Willfully. I sort of imagine. Um, so in the last little pit, we got about four minutes left. The what I think is also so great about the book, and everybody go buy this book. Let's be clear on what happened. This is only an hour. That, yes. That's going to change. It, it's, it's really great. But there's some action items about how we can participate and help the cause. Um, and I said to you guys yesterday, as a, whatever I am, I just call myself a hip hop nerd. I'm, I want to do more because I think this is something that we can actually do to keep brothers and sisters out of jail, which is what I should be spending most of my time doing. So you guys talked to us about like, so how do we wrap this up and move forward? What's the next step? Nice pun. Um, we, so we, we talk about a lot of things and I wanna make sure that Andrea has room also to address uh, just the way that we need to keep an eye on the kids too, because somebody did ask a question about the school to prison pipeline. And I do worry that the extent to which the hip teacher comes in, uses rap, has as you write some rap, but doesn't warn you of the consequences. I do worry about that a lot. Um, but I'll say that, you know, we, we offer a lot of things from aspirational 
like, let's have a ban on the use of rap lyrics. And we actually back up why we think this should happen, why they should not be introduced as, as, as evidence. I'm not gonna go into that now, you, you can read the end, but it is, that, that's one thing. But I will say the, what, the thing that I think the individual can do. Thank, thank, okay, thank you. And also the hip hop festival. I mean, to your the back, right? Okay. Anyway, other side. Yep. So no, for real. The thing that we have said is that if you one thing you can do, and I have seen this, right? I have testified in like ten of these cases. Juries now, now everywhere, basically, maybe not Oregon quite yet, but everywhere, you need a unanimous verdict. If you don't get a unanimous verdict. You're basically, you can't, you can't be found guilty. They can retry you, but that means that every individual who sits on a jury has a ton of power. That's always been true. And what we have said is that if you understand that introducing rap lyrics is intended to make you as a juror look at this guy like he's a criminal, like he's a thug, like he's hypersexual, like he's hyperviolent, basically every stereotype that America traffics in about young black men you should feel free to ignore it. And judges won't tell you you can do that. They'll, they won't let, in most places, won't let defense attorneys tell you you can do that. And prosecutors certainly won't, but you can. It's called nullification and we're just suggesting, we're not, even, we're not even saying you should just find somebody not guilty. I mean, you're welcome to. And maybe in some cases, like with drugs, you should. But we're saying that to the extent that they're using rap as evidence, you should go ahead and feel free to disregard that evidence and go with the rest of the case and see if that person is still guilty. To me, that is one example of where the individual citizen can turn this on its head. Um, so I'm going to give a push uh, for voting. Um, many people don't realize that their local um, Police officials, or at least sometimes a sheriff, sometimes the chief of police are elected. Um, depends on your jurisdiction, so you should look that, look that up. But also that your local district attorney um, is elected, right? So um, we focus a lot on federal elections, we focus on governors and mayors, but people need to pay attention to these front lines, um, criminal justice, uh, criminal legal system actors, um, police and prosecutors, and you have a choice when you vote for someone for those positions. And so you can um, investigate their background, their perspective. You can go to a town hall where they're taking questions and ask them what they think about this particular practice. Um, and you can decide whether to vote for them. And if you get enough people together and decide that this person is not who supports your particular values for criminal justice, then you can vote them out. Um, and you can look for someone else to back and support um, to run for these these positions. Um, but these uh, often these frontline um, police and prosecutors, the, the chief, the highest, the supervisors of the office are elected and they run on a platform that people need to uh, inquire about. Um, the other thing I will say is, yes, the school to prison pipeline. I'm very concerned about that. As I mentioned, part of my other bucket of work is uh, juvenile and family justice. Um, and what we see in our research for the book, but didn't make it as much into the book, um, is that there are plenty instances of um, students who write lyrics, whether because they're part of an assignment for a class, or whether because they do it because it's their own hobby, or because they're an aspiring artist, um, but they write lyrics, and somehow school officials learn about those lyrics, and um, the student ends up suspended or expelled. Um, for those uh, lyrics. And again, the theory, the, all of the conversation we've had about the use in criminal courts applies equally in school systems. Yes. Um, where, as Eric mentioned, right, hip hop is being used as a pedagogy, a way to teach students um, uh, different subjects, a way to engage their attention uh, as an outlet, an emotional outlet, um, normal adolescent behavior and yet it's being used to suspend them or expel them from school and which ultimately can push them into the criminal justice system if they're immediately if they're referred for charges or down the road. Yep. Um, so we are particularly concerned about that. I did have one more thing I wanted to say, Wes. Which please, is, please, we, please. We forgot to come back to a current case. Someone asked about current cases. Um, Daryl Caldwell uh, in Los Angeles. Draco. Um, 
Draco. Draco the ruler is probably the most prominent case right now that we can tell you about, that you can follow. Um, slight problem, two problems for him. One, he was already prosecuted, um, tried on charges, um, uh, on violent crime charges, uh, and acquitted of the most serious charge, homicide. He had um, a good expert. Yes, he had a good expert. You can figure out who that is. Yeah. Um, uh, he was convicted of uh, um, some of the minor charges. Gun, yeah. yeah um, One gun charge, and then it was hung on the gang stuff. Right, and then hung on the gang stuff. The government um, is retrying him uh, and, um, because they just have to get him because he's a rapper and he espouses violence in, the, in their opinion. Um, but uh, he's been in trial, uh, excuse me, in custody for quite some time. Um, his case was supposed to go to trial early this year, but he got caught up in the COVID-19 pandemic delay of proceedings. And so he's still sitting um, in jail awaiting retrial. Yep. Vote against Jackie Lacey for DA in LA County. She's terrible. There we go. Okay, anyway. No, thanks for that. Um, just yeah, I, I, just to things, I think uh, for everybody uh, in New York, Ken Thompson, Eric Gonzalez, uh, who are the, the Brooklyn DAs, right? They, they, we could put pressure on them. I think we got some, the weed sort of prosecutions went down. So I, I, that's actually, the voting local is so, so true. Um, but can I just quick, I know we're over and Bo's boss probably get us, uh, uh, hopefully don't turn us off. He won't do that, I'm joking. Um, but the experts, right, there's a thing about how people with some level of knowledge, and I hope that there's some uh, journalists, execs, uh, sort of yes. people that I've run with in our, in our chat today, is it, um, is it way that we contact, is it sort of contact you, the training? Just talk about that very quickly before we get out of here, if you could. Okay, if it, very quickly, so to, to give Andrea credit, what she wrote, like, fifth, the ten, what was it? No, 12 years? 2007, 13 yeah, years Whatever ago. it was, 13 years ago, was that we should, that if you have a client whose rap lyrics are being used against him, and I say him because it's always guys, is you should have an expert because the police don't understand rap music, so you should at least have another, a counter narrative. Well, you know, this many years ahead, we have that. Like, I, I've set, testified in a bunch. I've never really been challenged meaningfully. Um, and what, but, but the p people I'm testifying in contrast to, the police, the gang experts, are so bad. They don't know a single thing. I mean, I had somebody, a, 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 a prosecutor asked me a couple of years ago, because he had his gang police talking to him. Isn't it true that the top 50 selling rappers are all active gang members? And I'm like, no, <laughs> definitely not. Where did you get that? Um, that's de and it's been worse than that, right? So sometimes I'll be in a case and they'll bring in lyrics that a kid wrote. And then I look at it and I'm thinking, they just introduced these lyrics against this kid and went through the lyrics and said, you know, this shooting says he probably did this, blah, blah, blah. It's Dr. Dre. It's South Park Mexican. It's, it's, they don't have any clue. So what, we, what Andrea and I want to do and what other scholars are trying to replicate too is to create the ability for people who know what they're talking about. And you do not need a PhD. You do not need any of that to testify. I mean, these cops oftentimes, you know, they probably have a high school diploma but you just need to have the expertise. And so if you're willing to help us in the next year or so, I think we're, one of the things we have to do is look for funding, but also look for the, uh, the opportunity to start to train more people because I turn cases down because I'm too busy. Andrea can't because her expertise is the law, technically. So, and there are a few other people doing it, but we wanna create a cadre of people. We wanna create a group of people who can do this and go do it. And then if you, it, that's one way you can give back to the culture as a white guy, I don't have a lot of ways I can do it, but this is one where I actually go and I spend the time and I want to try to, and I learn about these young men as young men rather than criminals or animals or however the criminal justice system treats them. And so we want to create more people who can go walk and challenge these narratives in court. Well, I hope people will follow me. I told Andrew and Eric that I, I want to be down. I want to do what I can. And I hope other people who are 
who have the knowledge will follow because this is something we can really do and get done um, from a small to the systemic change. Uh, a couple of the things uh, on the last question, it was uh, Grammys changed the name from urban contemporary to progressive R&B. Uh, I was alerted that it sounded like I said aggressive, but progressive <laughs> R&B is the point of fact. Um, Actually, everyone, by the way, uh, aggressive R&B would be a cool category I, if you could define it. I, I, I had the same thought. I was like, hmm, who would be aggressive R&B? Like Tank or something like Jack? I mean, uh, the occasional weekend song or something. Right, yeah. right, right. right. Um, so the book, everybody, is Rap on Trial. Uh, bookshop.org has got a discount on it. The link is in the chat. This book is really, really good. These scholars are really, really uh, brilliant. Um, and I just wanted just a quick plug for the Brooklyn Historical Society. These events are free of charge. Um, even if we were, you know, in the Great Hall down on Pierpont Street or on Zoom. And uh, just thanks again to Bo and Marsha and Deborah and the whole team who put so much work in not only producing conversations like this, but I think the preeminent space for this type of discussion whether it be uh, racial rights, uh, you know, race and gender issues, sexuality, nobody's doing it like the Brooklyn Historical Society. So um, thank, you. thank you to Eric and Andrea. It's been a pleasure. I'm so glad thank I got you. a chance to meet you and I got a free book out of it. I feel like I should send y'all some money because I liked it so much. No, 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 Wes, you can send me a ticket like the next, the next Brooklyn Hip Hop Fest. Yep. Uh, you know done, I'm asking done. favors. <laughs> done, okay. done, 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 right. Barter, right? The most basic Dude. economy. So y'all are good. Um, but thank you guys so much. Uh, and thanks everybody for, for tuning in. Uh, we'll come back for the Brooklyn Historical Society. Best of luck to you, Andrew and Eric, and send us our marching orders. Thank you very much. Bye -bye, thank guys. you very much. Have a good night, everyone.